Um, that was the only Dutch I'll do, unless uh, there's anyone who would prefer this presentation to be given in Dutch. Yeah, too bad for you. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'd like to introduce Mike Place. Um, like I would like to say, there's no place like home. And uh, uh, to keep in line of his presentation, I'd like to uh, introduce Mike with a very well-known Dutch proverb that is, don't put salt on all snails. Good luck. Thank you so much. Uh, it's so wonderful to be here. I really appreciate the invitation uh, to to come out here uh, and, uh, and meet new friends. And uh, uh, my name is Mike Place. Uh, I am from uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, obviously, uh, a little, I'm a little bit uh, uh, far from home. Uh, but uh, like I said, it's really, really nice to travel out here. Uh, I am the director of engineering and the uh, principal uh, project maintainer uh, for the SaltStack project. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, SaltStack is a uh, a uh, project designed to uh, manage uh, Linux systems uh, and really all types of systems, but primarily Linux systems uh, at scale. Uh, I've been uh, working on this project uh, for about uh, four and a half years, and uh, these days uh, it keeps me very, very busy. So I'm excited to come here uh, and talk to you all uh, about what, uh, what we've been doing. Uh, before I begin, though, uh, we want to... Uh, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through a little bit about uh, how the SaltStack project uh, came into being because I think it's an interesting story and uh, it really helps to inform the way that we think about uh, systems management problems. Uh, talk a little bit about why I think uh, SALT uh, is a very good solution uh, for a wide variety uh, of systems management problems. Uh, then uh, talk very broadly about uh, the uh, architecture of SALT. Uh, for those who have uh, used SALT, uh, I'm sure one of the things that you very quickly have realized is that it's a very broad and very diverse ecosystem. And that uh, sometimes one of the big challenges that we have uh, is figuring out how to bootstrap people into a knowledge of that ecosystem. Uh, so I want to talk on a really high level about uh, how we see various components in the SALT ecosystem and how they fit together. And then after that, uh, I do what my marketing people always tell me not to do, which is to throw the slides away and just look at code. Uh, because that's the world that I come from, and uh, I feel like it would be a lot more fun uh, just to play with technology uh, instead of uh, just sitting and talking about it. Uh, so before I get to that, uh, you know, as uh, I came over here, uh, it, uh, I was hoping to, uh, you know, really finish and put a big uh, polish on my slides. Uh, one of my side projects is that uh, I work, uh, I run, um, a nonprofit uh, group in uh, Zimbabwe, and we teach uh, girls there uh, Python skills for, uh, so that they can have a better world. So as you can imagine, for me, uh, it's been kind of an intense 24 hours. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I've been doing a lot of trying to make sure that everybody uh, on the ground there is okay, and thankfully they are. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I like to do, especially when I talk about that, is just to encourage everybody to think about the open source community as a true global community. It's so easy for us to think about uh, open source as something that happens you know, primarily uh, in the US or in the Bay uh, or in Amsterdam or in parts of Europe. Uh, but it truly is uh, a global movement. And uh, even if you took nothing away from this talk uh, that is about SALT or about systems management, I would be very grateful uh, if over the course of the next year you remembered uh, that open source should be truly global uh, and uh, try to, uh, to do at least one thing over the course of the next year uh, in service of that fact. And additionally, when uh, I talk about community, I always like to come and I like to thank people. Uh, if any of you in here are a part of our community, uh, the SaltStack community, first off, thank you so much. Uh, if no one has thanked you uh, for your work on SALT, uh, then uh, please accept our thanks now. But more broadly, if 
your contributor anywhere in open source, and nobody has told you thank you lately, uh, from somebody who manages a large, pro large project on behalf of whatever project you work on, thank you so much uh, for your work. Whether that work is uh, uh, actually writing code, whether it's filing bugs, whether it's talking about uh, open source, whether it's advancing the principles of open source inside your organization. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, with that out of the way, let's talk uh, a little bit about SaltStack. Here's a brief timeline, and uh, I only like to put, point this out uh, so that I can tell uh, a story that I think is really funny. Um, so what happened, uh, Tom Hatch, who is the, uh, the original SaltStack author, uh, set out in 2011 to solve a problem. He was working for uh, an organization uh, that had a large number of machines, and by large number, I mean, you know, the 2011 version of large, so in the thousands to tens of thousands of machines. Uh, and he had to deploy patches across these machines. And he looked at all of the, the available options, and he looked at some of the big config management players uh, that were around at the time, uh, and he said, this stuff is all giving me uh, a huge headache. All I want to do is do um, uh, distributed remote execution, right? I want to be able to run a command on all 10,000 machines all at once. This should not be that hard, okay? So he said, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put together a couple of uh, you know, really easy off-the-shelf components. Uh, first, uh, a, uh, a high-speed message bus, right? Uh, Tom chose uh, something called ZeroMQ, right, uh, for that purpose. ZeroMQ, for those of you who don't know, uh, is um, a message transport uh, that supports a number of different topologies, uh, pub sub, push pull, things of that nature. Uh, and he added uh, some security and some authentication uh, on top of that, uh, and then added uh, a framework so that uh, he could use uh, a message bus or a message queue uh, as a transport for remote execution commands, right? Really simple idea. Uh, didn't take him that long to throw together. Uh, started using it, um, it uh, at the infrastructure that he was managing at the time. Worked great, you know. Everyone thought he was a little nuts, but you know it worked okay. And then uh, about nine or ten months later, something very strange happened. Right? He had put this project up on uh, GitHub, and there are you know a couple people who were interested. And he gets this email, and he uh, it says something along the lines of, "Hey, great project. Uh, we really like it. Did you hear some ideas? Did you think about expanding it in this way? And Tom sort of writes back and he says, oh yeah, that's really great. Uh, tell me about your use case. And they say, uh, well, uh, we work for a little company called LinkedIn. And, <laughs> and Tom says, oh no. <laughs> and uh, they say, yeah, we've deployed, uh, we've deployed salt in production. It's everywhere. And Tom doesn't sleep for like three days, has a complete you know, panic attack meltdown, which is exactly the right reaction, by the way, if you uh, start an open source project and you get an email like that. And um, uh, he, uh, he starts to realize, okay, this is really something. Uh, he calls another engineer uh, in town and says, hey, I think I've really got something here. And um, that guy's name was Joseph Hall, uh, who was the first engineer to start on this. Uh, and said, so Joseph, I think I've really got something here. And Joseph said, hang on. And then two minutes later, he calls back and he says, I just quit my job. I'll be at your house tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> and uh, a couple months after that, uh, he hired me. The three of us sort of like set off uh, on uh, this, this wonderful sort of terrible journey of uh, taking an open source project uh, and trying to add uh, a business around it, uh, which is uh, a wonderful, challenging, uh, humbling effort. Uh, but since then, uh, many amazing things have happened. Uh, SaltStack has been deployed all over the world. Uh, it runs millions upon millions upon millions uh, of machines uh, in a, a hugely diverse uh, set of environments. Uh, the project itself, uh, when we started, we had, you know, about 70 contributors, kind of day-to-day, -day, right? And, and, that was, and we thought that was the craziest thing we'd ever seen in our life, where like 70 people on Earth think this is cool. Oh, my God. Uh, well, little did we, <laughs> little did we know, 
uh, that it would not be that much longer uh, for us to get uh, all the way up over 80,000 commits, and we have a community of about 2,300 contributors. Uh, we have millions upon millions uh, of downloads. One of the big challenges when you're working on a project uh, like SaltStack is that um, it's not traditional software development uh, because uh, SaltStack and projects like it are ultimately our systems management frameworks which means that every day the ground shifts underneath you, right? Arch Linux decides to do something different, right? RHEL does whatever Red Hat does, right? Uh, if we did nothing to the code base, uh, six months later, it would, for the most part, stop working, uh, which means we have a really high-velocity project. It's not unusual uh, for us to merge between three and 5,000 lines of code a day. Uh, we see about 100 to 150 uh, pull requests a week, uh, and um, we have a very vibrant uh, community uh, around our issue tracker, people who are always uh, coming to us and helping us to understand uh, the areas in which SALT is working correctly and the areas, of course, uh, sometimes in which it is not. Uh, so like I said, this thing gets deployed all over the world. Uh, it runs huge infrastructures like uh, uh, the one at Intuit, uh, TD Bank, Clemson University, uh, and our friends at Adobe who have uh, recently taken Salt uh, and done two interesting things with it. First, they're using it widely to control all of their networking devices. Uh, and secondly, they started a project that uh, if you're a Salt user, I'm not going to demo it today, but if you are a Salt user and you're interested in security compliance and remediation, uh, our friends at Adobe uh, started a project called HubbleStack. Uh, and uh, HubbleStack does uh, all kinds of security monitoring, uh, um, immediate re uh, remediation, uh, and it all runs on top of Salt. So we thank our friends uh, over at Adobe for that work. SaltStack uh, has, I think, a couple of uh, advantages uh, in today's world. Uh, one of the things that we tend to see, uh, or that we tend to think deeply about, uh, is the life cycle of machines. It's really easy, and I think it's becoming even easier and potentially problematic in today's world to think about um, uh, machines as no longer having a life cycle, right? I come from uh, the old world, right, of the late 80s and, and early 90s, uh, when uh, we had the notion that, uh, hey, just completely rebooting machines might be kind of a bad thing. Uh, machines do have a life cycle beyond just provisioning them. They're going to require uh, security updates. They're going to require ongoing maintenance. And by the way, the notion of so-called immutable infrastructure gets you out of exactly none of those problems, right? It just doesn't, <laughs> right? It's, an, it's a fiction uh, to believe that any of that is true. Uh, and so, uh, but on the... Um, it's also true that as w um, with the advent of virtualization, with the advent of containerization, uh, it's by no means unusual uh, for even a moderately sized data center uh, to contain millions or tens of millions uh, of individual instances, be they containers right, or VMs or what have you, uh, that need to be addressed individually and managed. Uh, because of that revolution, uh, it requires a sophisticated uh, management backplane that, in our view, does more than simply describe and provision systems. We need to be able to not only address those systems, but we need to be able to create a management framework uh, that uses automation so that uh, that system uh, can self-heal, so that that system can be aware of degradation, respond accordingly, uh, so that we have an immediate and real-time awareness of that system that can be integrated into our automation workflows, right? Be it security remediation, be it business workflows, or what have you, right? Uh, one of the concepts that I find uh, interesting is that a lot of times you hear um, uh, projects that are in this space talk about the idea of orchestration, but not a lot of people really understand what orchestration is. Uh, and so I want to give you a really quick definition, just so as you're evaluating uh, projects in this space, you can understand the concept of orchestration. 
uh, orchestration in the systems management world is the notion that in order to perform a task uh, in an uh, infrastructure, there may be a series of dependent steps, uh, which is to say, like a really classical example of this is, all right, in order to deploy my web application, I must first shut down a load balancer prior to uh, updating code on a web server, for example. So the notion of orchestration means that you need to be able to define and target those groups of machines and the services that they run, and then programmatically declare dependencies between those so that you can create uh, automation workflows uh, that uh, correspond to the way that your application is designed and needs to be updated uh, moving forward. OK. The last thing that I want to say, uh, and I didn't mention this in the timeline, but it's a really important point. And um, sometimes we get beat up a, a little bit about this, and it's something that I'm actually really proud of, and so I really encourage people <laughs> to talk about this, which is the notion that SaltStack is known for being a part of the configuration management space, uh, but we don't really see ourselves that way. Uh, we started out with remote execution. It was actually a, um, a community contribution that brought config management to SaltStack. It wasn't something that we set out to go and do. Um, but it speaks to the way that we see configuration management, which is that we see configuration management as a service in part of a larger automation ecosystem. Right? Uh, configuration management does the heavy lifting to make the changes that you need, but it simply isn't sufficient in today's world to imagine that you can have uh, configuration management and that you can manage a complex infrastructure. It's only one small component, and we try to speak to the entire automation story, not just uh, that single point. So how does all this work? Let's talk uh, about architecture and the way that uh, we have all of this structured, and then we can get to code, I swear. No more slides. Uh, so SALT works as uh, uh, many projects in this space do uh, in a hub-spoke model, right? Uh, we have uh, machines that we call masters, OK? Uh, masters, this is like a federalized model, right? So masters uh, are centralized machines uh, and that uh, devices which are to be managed which are called minions, right? You see them down here. It can be Windows machines, Linux machines, AX machines, network devices, IoT, right? Uh, it runs a kernel. We try to manage it. Uh, these minions connect back to uh, a salt master uh, over what we call uh, the event bus, right? Now, the title of this talk is uh, Event Driven Infrastructure. And we're going, I'm going to keep banging on that uh, as I go through the hour. Excuse me. Because um, we believe that um, we can take principles from event-driven programming, things like uh, asynchronicity, right? Uh, being able to listen uh, to a common stream of events uh, and react to them, right? Uh, is a way that we can uh, manage and reason about infrastructure in a really intelligent, dynamic way. And we'll get to the specifics of how that operates. Uh, but the point is that um, always remember that between salt minions and salt masters uh, is this event bus where uh, event publications can flow from a master, right? Uh, things like a command that says do X, right? Or install Y, right? Or tell me about Z, right? Uh, and returns which flow back uh, from minions along that bus. The master has a couple of components uh, that uh, are named somewhat arbitrarily, uh, and it can be somewhat of a struggle for people who are new to Salt. Uh, to get their heads around these concepts. Uh, so I want to just talk about them very generally before I demonstrate how some of them work. Uh, the first is uh, a piece of code that can execute on a master, which is called a runner. Okay? Uh, what a runner does is, uh, from the master, it can execute uh, 
any sort of set of sequential steps, right? It can say, do these remote execution uh, steps. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, the nice thing about SaltStack in and of itself, and we'll see this as we get into code, is that it's all just Python at the end of the day. It's just Python and data structures, right? We try to put those into larger containers, uh, but uh, our approach is that, uh, that your workflow uh, is, should, is and should be tailored uh, to your business and to your use case. And so we're interested in trying to give you structures where you can write uh, a little bit of Python, use external Python libraries, whatever, it ne whatever you need uh, uh, to solve the problems uh, that you have. On the master, just sort of really quickly, uh, there are a number of components uh, that I want to point out, uh, one of which uh, is called Salt Cloud. Uh, Salt Cloud gives you the ability to reach out to either commercial cloud providers or to uh, a private cloud uh, and provision instances. Um, it does the same thing uh, if you want to be able to provision containers or VMs or anything else. Uh, so the concept uh, of Salt Cloud run from the master is basically to say, OK, go out to AWS and you know, spin up you know, 50 instances. Make sure that they're all bootstrapped with Salt. Let them all check in with a master. And then you're off to the races, which is really, really nice because that means you can use Salt uh, from the moment that you're ready to get your infrastructure off the ground, right, uh, all the way through its day-to-day uh, -day, uh, management, all right? Uh, Salt, uh, the Salt master also contains uh, a file server. We use that file server to deliver uh, configuration data down to minions. Uh, when you're reading the Salt documentation, you'll see uh, many references to files called SLS files. We'll look at those momentarily. Uh, we call those Salt state files. Uh, the nice thing about the uh, Salt stack uh, file server <laughs> Uh, and in fact, all of SALT in general, is that uh, we believe in uh, a paradigm that, uh, frankly, we kind of made up, but we think it's pretty good, so we're trying to advocate for it, uh, that we call uh, plug-in-oriented development, right? Uh, you've seen this term kind of thrown around in, in a few other places, but we're really big advocates for it, which is the notion that everything in the SALT stack ecosystem should be pluggable, right? We come you know, from Unix backgrounds. Uh, we believe in small sets uh, of disparate tools, but we believe in connecting those uh, through a common bus, uh, which is, you know, you're seeing here. And we believe that that's the way you can actually build out uh, and manage uh, distributed systems. And so for this file server, uh, it has pluggable backends. For example, if you want to store all your configuration on disk, great. If you want to store it uh, in Git, uh, you can have uh, a Git file server. Uh, if you want to store it in databases, great. If you want to have your own uh, um, file storage mechanism, you just write a file server plugin. It's really easy. And then you're off to the races. And you'll hear that story again and again and again. Uh, the uh, second to last component uh, on the master that you'll want to know about uh, is something called the pillar. Uh, the pillar is the name for uh, our um, secret storage. Uh, and so if, for example, you're going out and you need to uh, write out configuration files that have secrets in them and you need a place where uh, those secrets can be stored, they can be stored on the master. Now, this gives you uh, a really nice sort of framework uh, because um, the master stores those secrets uh, and it can store information about uh, which connected minions uh, have access to those secrets. And so when those minions go and they try to write out, for example, configuration files, they can uh, have access to the file template itself, but then reach, reach back to the master uh, to ask for the secret information to be templated in. Uh, the last piece, uh, or last two pieces that I want to talk about uh, are my two favorite pieces of salt. Uh, the first on the master side is called an engine. And uh, it's going to sound silly that I think that this is like my favorite piece, uh, but it just is. Uh, it is an arbitrary process that can live on the master that has access to all of the salt functionality and can um, uh, tune in to the master's event bus, 
Uh, and from there, it's simply arbitrary Python. Now, what does this do at the end of the day? What this means is you can write some arbitrary Python, and it can listen to events flowing in from these minions, right? Those events can be file system events, they can be events in your application, they can be configuration state changes, they can be anything that you can imagine, and we'll go through a demo of this momentarily. Uh, but then you can write an engine that says, oh, okay, if I see event X come in, uh, then I'm going to perform action Y. And again, it's just arbitrary Python. You just write code, but you get this whole uh, authenticated high-performance event system uh, for free, right? It's it shows how we extend out from the configuration management model. Uh, the last two items uh, are on the minions themselves. Uh, the first is uh, grains. That's our bits of arbitrary information uh, that, uh, about each machine, like it runs this OS. Uh, you can add arbitrary grains, like this minion is located in this data center, uh, so on and so, so forth. And finally, um, both on the minion and master side, Excuse me. We have a concept called the returner, which says, oh, "Okay, uh, in place of or in addition to sending information about uh, the job that's being run on the minion, uh, also send that to a MySQL database or to what uh, to Splunk or you know uh, what have you." All right. Okay. Uh, we talked a little bit uh, about what orchestration is. Now, one of the ways that the analysts really like to talk about this space, which is like infuriating to me because I think it's a dumb distinction, um, is between the notion of agent-based and agentless, right? Um, agent-based, of course, you know, is the notion that you know you have to install software uh, on a minion, right, in order for that. Uh, or for a managed machine, right, in order to manage it. Uh, agentless is this notion that, oh, you can just have something like SSH, which, by the way, is still an agent, right, and by the way, still has, you know, its own sets of security problems, if anyone's been paying attention. Um, but um, the notion that you can, quote, just have uh, SSH as a daemon, uh, and then you can um, run, uh, you, you can manage your infrastructure just through SSH. Uh, well, we thought, okay, that's fine, and so uh, we were on a plane ride once, uh, and we had a dare, and we said, I'll bet we can write agentless support for salt uh, before we land on the ground. Uh, and we did, which was great, right? Uh, and since then, it's extended. Uh, and so uh, if inside your company uh, people are choosing to have that debate, some people are in the agentless camp, some people are in the agent-based camp, you can just say, it doesn't matter, salt does both, right? Uh, and I'll show you uh, an example uh, of how that works. Uh, we mentioned that Salt uh, has a, a rich uh, configuration management uh, service, right? Uh, it's all declared uh, out of the box uh, in YAML uh, with Jinja. Now, uh, every now and then we hear from people who are like, oh, YAML makes my head hurt. It's, it's just terrible, right? Or Jinja makes my head hurt or whatever. Uh, and we agree, right? Uh, YAML is fine, it, it works fine, you know, it's, it's human readable, it's not the fastest serialization framework in the world, but that's life in the big city. Um, but Salt's attitude is that uh, it's all just data. So we created uh, what we call a set of rendering systems, uh, which means that uh, if you don't like YAML, if you want to use pure Python, great. If you want to use a Python DSL, great. If you want to use JSON, great. So long as you can give us Pythonary, Python dictionaries and lists, we're out. We don't care. It's cool, all right? Um, but uh, the examples that you'll see in the documentation are all based around YAML for uh, our configuration uh, management syntax, all right? Uh, we talked a little bit about this notion of uh, event-driven automation. We'll show some examples uh, of that here in a moment. Uh, but um, the main idea here is that um, as events are flowing back from these managed systems, we can tie those events back to reactions on the master or the manager, right? So here's one example of that. Uh, you might say, okay, uh, when uh, a, a file is changed, okay, uh, on a minion, uh, 
monitor that, right, which uh, we have a, a service called Beacons, right, which you can set up uh, to continuously check uh, for changes on a system, right, using something like iNotify, for example. Um, in the event uh, that this file changes, uh, send uh, an event back up to the master. On the master side, we can configure it such that we can say, oh, okay, if this file changes, then that means that uh, we need to modify systems over here in the other part of this data center, or we need to send a notification to these individuals at home and wake them up, or, oh, we need to set uh, this file back to its original state. Because we believe that at the end of the day, in order to manage systems effectively going forward, we need to st break down the walls between traditional monitoring and systems management, right? Um, I know um, uh, some of the um, people from Honeycomb I.O. I think are here. I'm really looking forward uh, to hearing them uh, talk about this this afternoon because I think they think about this uh, question and the, the concepts of observability uh, very well. So, ah, too early for that. It's all right. Okay. Can everybody see that okay? Do you want me to bigify any of this? Yes, I think is what I heard. Okay. So, uh, let's start to play around uh, with some of this and, uh, excuse me while I do that, uh, and see how this works. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to, okay, getting better? No? Yes? Okay, well, that's, that's going to be the size it is. So, so up here, right, uh, I have the concept of uh, a salt master. Uh, we'll just uh, start this thing up here. Okay. Now, what I want to show you is that uh, first I want to start with the concept of remote execution, the first problem that we set out to solve, right? Uh, okay, how can I reach out to some uh, targeted list of machines to manage and just run things like arbitrary commands? Uh, so what we have is we have this concept of an execution module. These execution modules range from things like uh, just run a shell command to uh, higher level abstractions like start or stop a service. Now, why do we need higher level abstractions? Well, because, <laughs> because system D, for example, right? Uh, because the way that we start and stop services across different distributions and more importantly, across entirely different operating systems is different. But in order to manage uh, systems effectively, it's much easier from a centralized location to just say, OK, start the Apache service, whether this is on Windows or CentOS, whatever, systems management framework, you go figure that bit out. I don't really care, right? Um, so anyhow, uh, we, start, we started the master there. Let's start up one salt minion here, OK? And we're going to just accept the key for that here. OK. So uh, what happens there, the way that authentication works, uh, is that um, we use uh, um, uh, uh, public key, <laughs> sorry, haven't slept for a few days, uh, public key encryption uh, to uh, transmit a shared AES key uh, because we want it to be fast and not suck. Uh, OK. So let's actually, let's look at um, the way these execution modules are constructed. Uh, the point that I want to continually get across to you is that none of this code is hard. It's, it's exceed, if you know any Python, right, you could literally spend a morning teaching yourself enough Python to figure out how to write uh, execution modules. Uh, this stuff is just absolutely dead simple. Uh, let's look at... Um, our little tried and true uh, function that we have here, um, which is basically just called ping, right? We've added a little bit of sauce here, um, but at the end of the day, all this thing really does is it returns true, right? Now, uh, what I want to show you here is the way that this namespacing works. This is uh, 
very Pythonic, right? Uh, we have a Python module which is called test, right? Test.py, as you can see, right? And we have a function that is called ping, right? And we just namespace that out uh, in a Pythonic way, excuse me, uh, so that we can do like this, right? And there we go, like that, okay? Um, so just understanding those concepts, you should be able to go and immediately use any of these execution modules, of which I don't even know how many dozen are shipping with salt right now, Qu quite a lot, maybe even up to 100. Um, and so, for example, you can also pass these uh, arguments. Uh, we have one uh, that is our very favorite uh, called uh, test.fib. Uh, as a little bit of insider knowledge, if you ever uh, interview on our engineering team, uh, writing efficient Fibonacci sequences uh, is our first interview question. Uh, and it's a great interview question, actually. So if people are like, what's that? Or <laughs> like, have a nice day. Um, but um, so you can do, for example, right, test.fib, right, uh, which gives you um, uh, the, uh, the first Fibonacci uh, number there, OK? OK, uh, so that's uh, execution modules. Um, as you can see, uh, there's a large number of them here. Um, they, uh, you know, I don't even, like I said, I don't even remember how many. Uh, but it's, you can do things like, um, you know, uh, managing SMTP or sending email uh, or uh, managing system services or ZFS or, or anything else. Uh, and of course, it's really common uh, and very much encouraged uh, for you to, to write your own uh, for your individual needs. OK, that's all pretty straightforward. That's remote, remote execution. I should show you one more thing, right? Uh, we have a saying uh, in the office uh, that is basically, uh, when in doubt, shell out five minutes. Oh, wow, OK. I better go quickly. Uh, and so you can do something like uh, command.run, right? Uh, echo, hello, right? OK. So uh, because apparently uh, time management, not my forte, somehow I thought I had considerably more time, but I guess not. Uh, let me show you uh, how the uh, configuration management uh, syntax works uh, in uh, a very simple way. Um, OK, actually, let me do this. Uh, so we have uh, a series of what we call uh, states, OK? Uh, states uh, are another uh, pluggable subsystem uh, in SALT, uh, and they declare the idempotent state of a system. Uh, by idempotency, we mean if we uh, run it uh, more than one time, and the second time no changes are to, me to be made, changes will not happen, right? It's a difference between saying, always start this service and only start this service if the service is not already started, OK? Um, now, the, the same sort of framework that, uh, that we looked at with execution modules uh, applies here. Um, if, for example, uh, you look at uh, the group state, uh, you might see uh, group dot right, present uh, that takes uh, arguments and keyword arguments. Uh, those map really simply uh, into uh, YAML. Uh, so let me show you an example of how that might look, because uh, I went way too long with the other descriptions. I'm not going to have time to get too far into it. Um, but uh, it might look like this, right? Uh, the way our configuration management syntax works is uh, a top-level key. Now, one secret when you're uh, learning um, YAML for the first time, if you don't already know, it's really, really simple. It looks, it looks ridiculous, but it's really easy. Which is to say, if you see a colon, uh, what you're dealing with is uh, a dictionary key value, right? The key being before the, the colon, value being after, right? And if you see a dash, uh, you're dealing with a list. Uh, so this is very, very simple. So if, all right, we go here, right, and we look at the file state, right, and we look at managed, what we see here is, here's the name of our state that we want to run, right? Here is the state itself, where file, right, is the name of the state module, and managed here, the name of the function, right? And then we just go ahead and start passing arguments in as such, right? 
We could, for example, if we go up here, here's a really simple one, right, uh, that tells uh, the configuration management uh, system how to install a package named uh, Vim, right? Mm -hmm. The name of the state, again, install Vim, the package module, the installed function, and uh, we provide a list where the first argument, right, is the name of the thing to install. Uh, OK, uh, so that's how states work. Um, to execute uh, any given uh, state, oops, sorry, uh, with, uh, with our syntax, uh, it's just salt, and then the name of the system or systems that you wish to target. Uh, those can be targeted in a variety of ways, either uh, individually, by host name. We talked about what grains were, these arbitrary facts about systems. So you could say, you know, for example, uh, target all systems, right, where uh, the OS is uh, Mac OS, which you'd never want to do because it's a, a Linux conference, but, you know, if that was your thing. Um, but, um, or of course, by host name, right, uh, no, the, the, um, the, the one thing to remember here is that uh, when you're using the salt command line, um, you always call into execution modules. So if you want to uh, invoke the configuration management system, that is in itself its own execution module called state, right? Okay. Uh, and that can be a little bit off-putting to people until they realize how that uh, connectivity works. Um, if you do state.sls, that indicates, uh, okay, salt, on the system called silver, run the execution module state with the function sls and give it the argument demo, which would correspond uh, up here uh, to this demo. And then uh, we can run that. All right. All right, type in all the secrets. And there we go. Uh, in 33 milliseconds, what we did was we managed to um, go out. Uh, we told uh, the minion, uh, OK, we want to write out this file. Uh, the file that we wrote out here oops, uh, looked like uh, this. OK. Um, here is an example of uh, uh, a state file. Uh, we talked about them being serialized with YAML. They're actually serialized with uh, YAML plus uh, Jinja interpolation in the middle, right? Which means that uh, what we can do is we can throw some Jinja in into the middle, uh, and we can use that so that uh, we can reach out again to the part uh, uh, to parts of Salt to get things like secrets. Uh, so here we're we're showing that um, what you can do is go okay. Uh, we're going to write a file called secret file. We're going to put it in slash temp slash foo. We're going to run it through the Jinja renderer. So here in 33 milliseconds, we told, we published a command to a minion, or it could have been tens of thousands of minions, um, said, OK, I want you to run this state. The minion went back to the master, retrieved uh, the uh, state file that it needed to run, unpacked that, just uh, looked at the file, said, oh, I'm kind of going to need a secret, went back to the master, got the secret, inserted the secret into the file. It was then fully rendered, and then wrote it out to disk uh, in 33 milliseconds, uh, which is not too shabby, if you ask me. I have about one minute left, uh, so forgive me for leaving out like 50% of the demo stuff that I have. But uh, I'm more than happy uh, to grab a table or sit around with people uh, at any point today uh, and go through things. Uh, and, or lunch, yes, I lunch. Uh, but uh, in the, the one minute that I have remaining, I'm happy to, to take questions about this uh, sort of freewheeling, uh, uh, quick-moving uh, tour through the SALT ecosystem. No? Okay. Thank you very much. Oh.